Thank you, Rita, for the uh, invitation to speak and the introduction, and uh, good morning to everyone here. Uh, so, I was really excited to be invited to speak with Creative Mornings because it, they always have these interesting topics uh, that are sort of left field and, and random, uh, this month's being humility. Uh, I'm an urban designer, city planner, and so the question of what does humility have to do with cities uh, was a, a concern, right? You know, what, how am I going to connect that dot? Uh, but I think the basic premise that humility is sort of the recognition that something uh, is bigger than you uh, is, was my starting point. And so the talk today, I want to talk about humility and loving our cities. Uh, the Love Indy campaign and a lot of that work that's been going on here in Indianapolis, I think ties into this notion of humility. Uh, looking at the definitions, you know, there are kind of a lot of religious and other uh, uh, notions for what humility means in, in the context. Uh, but a part that I really wanted to pull out was this notion of having a clear perspective and respect for one's place in the context. A uh, very important notion, you know, identifying how you see yourself and how you see your context and your role within it. So the popular image, it might come to mind when you think of, of humility as someone like, you know, Mother Teresa, you know, working with, you know, the youth or the poor, or there might be other kind of images that pop into mind, which is that this is not humility, right? And, you know, this notion of understanding context and respect, I think, is, is something that's important. Uh, and I think that Indianapolis has been sort of on this national stage and really recognizing that Indianapolis had its own moment uh, of humility and sort of recognizing uh, that Indianapolis is a place uh, for all and what that means. So thinking about the role of cities and, and people and thinking about loving our cities is really requiring that you love and respect all the people that inhabit them. Uh, and that's something that I think is really a basis for uh, all of our interactions and the work that you do in your own way. Uh, so to begin the talk, uh, and again I'm an urbanist so this is uh, my approach to things is to explain to people that cities are people, right? So, you know, you might think of your city, you might think of Indianapolis and think of the highways and its location and its geography, the buildings, uh, etc. You might compare it to a place like New York, where, where I work now, that obviously has a very different pattern, right? It's more dense, it's got water, uh, you know, all these different things but cities really are the people. Uh, this is a GIS uh, analysis map of the demography of New York City. So every pixel is a person uh, and all the different colors are all the different ethnicities, the different types of people. And so in New York, you obviously have high density and really a, a mosaic uh, of people. Uh, Indianapolis is a little different in comparison, so it's not as intense, right? Uh, but, you know, it's, it's one-tenth in New York, it's still a, a critical mass of, of people that are sort of put together. And when we think about sort of the heart of Indianapolis, and you sort of zoom in a little bit, you know, all these pixels, all these little dots, you get to see a pattern in that there is sort of a rich tapestry here in Indianapolis as well. Um, so I wouldn't be a good urbanist or contemporary urbanist if I didn't quote Jane Jacobs. Uh, where she said that cities have the capacity, uh, capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. And I think uh, the hall and, and the work going on with Plan 2020 is a, a good illustration of that work. Uh, so what I wanted to sort of present to you in this idea of, of humility and, and thinking about uh, cities and, and the people that, that make them uh, is to look at the, uh, the roots of a city. So. Uh, I've done a lot of work and research uh, on this of my own roots, my own family history, uh, but also the history of Indianapolis, and I think that this is uh, an opportunity to learn from the past uh, and think about the humble histories uh, that make uh, Indianapolis and its people. Uh, so this is inner city Indianapolis. At the bottom of the image is uh, the canal. Uh, the large building is Crispus Attucks High School and the fabric that you see around it was uh, the old part of Indianapolis where uh, black people 
lived uh, up until uh, sort of the urban renewal era, uh, and these were the conditions that they lived in. Uh, it was really a humble uh, sort of situation, right? Uh, no running water, uh, poverty, crime, a lot of different issues, and this was happening right in the heart of the city through policy, through a lot of different uh, sort of mechanisms that determined who was in the city and, and what they had access to. Uh, so in my history, uh, you know, thinking about uh, what are ways out of this, uh, some of you may be familiar with Flanner House, so that was an organization that worked really from the 1900s forward with social services and working on how to remake and, and improve people's conditions in the city. And they had a whole host of different programs that included what they called self-help services and, and social programs. Uh, so this guy, and I look very much like him, was my grandfather. Uh, so growing up, I was told that my grandfather was a farmer, uh, sort of very simply. Uh, and so humble beginnings, you know, a farmer, but what he actually did is he was the agricultural director for the Flanner House. So in the 1930s, 1940s, he ran a large urban agriculture program in inner city uh, Indianapolis where he taught people how to farm land in the city. Uh, so this is not an image from some farm somewhere in Tennessee. This is in inner city Indianapolis, circa 1940. <coughs> So the programs that he created served over uh, 600 families. Uh, they had uh, approximately 200 acres of land uh, spread throughout inner city Indianapolis that they tended. So everything from backyard gardens uh, that people would grow their vegetables and, and make a little extra money to they actually had a large farm. This is somewhere on Kessler Boulevard uh, in, in the 1940s uh, that they farmed at large scale uh, agriculture uh, that they had through a, a large farmers cooperative that was here in the city. Uh, so, you know, they had all this food, what do we do with it? They were in, sort of in, uh, innovative people, and so they said, well, we need to can it. So they built a cannery, uh, and they would teach people how to can their own food. Things got a little more complicated, and that, you know, okay, now we have all these cans. Uh, so they built a kitchen uh, that they put in the neighborhood, and so they had a demonstration kitchen, and they would teach people how to cook their food. So that, you know, this is a very innovative group and little by little they're sort of building capacity, starting with growing the tomato up to, you know, building a place to teach people how to cook food. Uh, and they really were working to improve people at the individual level in very humble ways. You know, the, the teenage kid, how do you give him something to do uh, that's not, you know, being in the streets and crying, you know, give him a job uh, in a way to help his family. You know, of course, uh, the idea of leadership and how you uh, create uh, sort of capacity uh, within a community is important and so they worked with veterans that were returning from the war that they had some kind of leadership skill and ability uh, and they would become sort of leaders in this group and, and leading the cooperatives and the business uh, organizations they even had a credit union uh, so again they're, they're sort of building capacity building capacity and something that they recognized is this notion that you know, people have to work together. Uh, so this is a social graph, and this, again, this is from, you know, the 1940s, 1950s, uh, that they were doing this work where each one of those numbers is a family uh, in this community, and they mapped out and networked what were the bonds, what were the connections uh, between those families that they could use then to build uh, capacity in that community, identify leadership, and other things like money, resources, uh, time to make those connections. So this is before, long before Facebook, LinkedIn, all the things that we take advantage uh, uh, of today, but they were doing it back then to improve their local conditions. So, you know, they had meetings, uh, they sort of built capacity and decided what they were gonna do to make their city better. Uh, they went to the planning commission and you have to think at the time, you know, 1940s, 1950s, this was very radical for a group of sort of a black community to go to the city planning commission and tell the city this is what we want for our neighborhood. Uh, but the, the work was approved. Uh, they got funding uh, to do this work, uh, some of it from Lily Endowment at the time. And they, with their self-help services program, uh, had a home building program. So the people would actually build their own homes. Uh, the first one they built took about 6,000 hours <laughs> uh, because they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, 
over time through the program, you know, the knowledge was built in and they were able to get that down to about uh, 2,000 hour, man hours, which is still a lot, but, uh, you know, these families were able to build their own homes uh, and that was how they got the equity for down payments because they obviously didn't have the, the economic station to do so. So this, these are the homes, again, the notion of humility and, you know, this is sort of a humble home in a way, but uh, this is very important because these are homes that people in this neighborhood built themselves and it was their city. Uh, so they were able to get kind of a FHA mortgage uh, and have this design and they built this little neighborhood, which is uh, still there today. And the important thing about this is, you know, it doesn't look like much, you know, today, you know, this is pretty blah urban suburbia. But, you know, these homes were designed by a prominent black architect at the time. Uh, you know, they were built by black people in that community. Uh, and the infrastructure, everything that was there was through the work of, of those very humble people. Um, so this is kind of what they started with. These the mile squares in blue. Uh, Lockville Gardens, which was the, uh, you know, the federal government's answer, right, build public housing. Uh, is in orange, and then the Fall Creek Homes uh, neighborhood is in red. So this is what they started with. Uh, the black people lived kind of where it flooded, <laughs> you know, in slums. Uh, but they re-engineered and re developed that with a park at the waterfront uh, and the new homes and, and sort of a, a street grid. Uh, and this neighborhood sort of persists to today uh, in kind of the core uh, of downtown Indianapolis. So this is sort of a history that I think it's important for people to, to know about Indianapolis and to know about cities, that there is this sort of other narrative for how people uh, can make and contribute to their city. So all of this work and kind of being inspired by that and by being an, an urbanist, urban designer, I uh, thought about how do we take some of those ideas and the work uh, that they did forward to today. And so we call it uh, past forward, right? How do we bring that, uh, what they did to today and think about how we adapt it for our situations now to make things better. So my family and I, my mom and dad are here somewhere, uh, my brothers, we have a, a group that we started called Urban Patch uh, with the goal to make uh, the inner city better. Uh, so why that is, is because I'm, as Rita mentioned, I'm from Indianapolis. I grew up, we just called it the north side, they keep renaming all the neighborhoods, but uh, you know, grew up on the north side, north off of 38th Street. Uh, but this is the context, right? It was a uh, declining inner city story that's very familiar uh, in the U.S. Uh, so this is uh, a map by the planning department. Uh, all the red and green are vacant or low assessed value property. And so you have high concentrations of disinvestment. So this is the context uh, that I grew up in, uh, in, in Indianapolis. And it's something that sort of pers uh, persists to today that has a lot of uh, social and economic uh, considerations. Uh, so the first project of Urban Patch was to say, okay, what can we do in our little way, our very limited financial and time resources? And we did a project which was to uh, just do something, right? So we looked at the situation. The problem was vacant buildings and vacant lots. Uh, so we bought uh, a vacant building and a vacant lot, and we worked with a uh, community on a, a one-acre community garden, uh, kind of at the center of this sort of patch of red and, and green. Um, so this was the uh, vacant building we bought on, on Delaware uh, Street, and it was a foreclosed home that was long vacant. Uh, it had a lot of structural problems. Uh, it sort of not exactly ready to be demolished, but it, it was gonna be there soon. Uh, and we just simply fixed it up. Uh, got the resources, the mortgage, and uh, contractor to, to get, bring that part of the city back. Uh, very humble uh, idea, very small, just one little piece, but it was important. We also worked with uh, Fall Creek Gardens. Uh, some of you may uh, know of that organization, but it's a one acre garden. Uh, on a sort of assemblage of what were formerly uh, sort of commercial spaces on Central, on 30th and Central. And we worked with them, you know, on garden programs and things, but we also thought the idea of helping rebrand and re-image that part of the community was, was important. And so we did the sunflower mural uh, that if you ever drive kind of south on Central, you probably know it and see it. Uh, my brother is the, the artist. Uh, he actually did several designs uh, for the mural and uh, we voted it out 
uh, with the community uh, to select the, the design of the sunflowers. One uh, in this image here shows uh, students from Shortridge High School uh, that kind of helped to come and to paint the mural. So there is an aspect of community involvement, but there's also an aspect of simply beautifying uh, the neighborhood. Uh, the third piece of it was to take, again, all these vacant lots in the neighborhood. We took one of the vacant lots. Um, we worked with volunteers and some limited resources to turn it into a, a community asset. Uh, so we did this in the middle of like that horrible drought a couple years ago that some of you remember. Uh, so that was a humbling experience uh, to try to create a garden in the middle of a drought. Uh, but this is it today, uh, and it's sort of designed around permaculture, uh, uh, strategies so the plantings are things that don't need a lot of maintenance like a traditional community garden needs and it's something that is really a resource that people can come and get fruits and, and uh, herbs just from walking through the garden. Um, we've got our little bus stop here so it's a transit oriented garden. Um, and then finally we have our stone soup kitchen which are classes that my, my mother and some of her friends uh, that know how to can teach people in the community uh, how to can all this food, and this is sort of a direct copy of, of the work that Flanner House did. So all of these things are sort of small projects that just, you know, me and my family are, are doing in the neighborhood, but we work with a lot of different partners and people that we talk to, collaborate with, rub ideas, do projects uh, that we work with. So it's everything from neighborhood organizations to, uh, you know, the American Community Gardening Association to artist groups. Uh, to crowdfunding and, and banks. Uh, so this is all that's really necessary to do even these little projects. Um, and so, the, you know, we've got our start with, with simple crowdfunding, so using new tools. Uh, IOB is a group that they, they actually predate Kickstarter, they'll always tell you, uh, but it's sort of a Kickstarter for uh, either community or urban projects. So everything from urban mapping analysis to building a bike lane, uh, they will help you crowdfund it. So that was how we really got our, our start. Uh, so we've done other projects. So we've done community engagement. So this is a, a workshop that we did in the neighborhood uh, with uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation uh, that was interested in preservation issues in inner city communities. And we really worked with uh, people from the neighborhood and local residents, everything down to youth, uh, up to the bankers uh, that were lending in the neighborhood to talk about the future of that community and so getting the ideas from everyone uh, was very important in that work. And then as uh, was mentioned, I uh, worked with uh, Plan 2020 to think about ideas that work for the city at large uh, and that included uh, what we call the Crossroads Plan which you can go on the Plan 2020 website and see it but it was thinking about uh, the Connect Indy and the transit uh, future of this neighborhood and uh, what I call the bicycle-oriented development along uh, the Monon Trail, that there can be new kinds of investment here as well. And so the uh, final project I'll show, and some of you may be familiar with this uh, because we've gotten some local press and things on it, uh, is the Indy Redbud project. Uh, and this is an initiative where we uh, recently got the 5x5 five five, uh, Indie Hub grant to really kickstart the project. And the idea is that we are going to simply help make people love a part of Indianapolis, to love their community and to make it visible. Uh, so we are taking again, remember the red blotches, uh, we've got a lot of them to, to address, we're taking them on one by one. Uh, we purchased a couple of city lots, vacant lots, uh, and we're going to simply plant red bud trees uh, there. So we'll plant little baby ones and eventually we'll get a little bigger. Uh, and then we'll give those trees out to people in the community uh, and working with a number of other partners for larger scale plantings. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, throughout this whole part of the neighborhood, you can have sort of one thing that helps to unify the neighborhood. Uh, you know, anyone that's been to a cherry blossom festival or something like that, you kind of know the impact that that can have, but imagine that happen uh, sort of in this neighborhood and helping to highlight the assets of the community. So, you know, along the Monon Trail, you know, when people are biking through, there's a section that changes and people register it differently uh, and connect to that part of the city, uh, or simply uh, walking down their own streets, uh, and finally, uh, along Fall Creek, having a, a totally different image of that neighborhood. 
So this contributes to the, uh, you know, the environment. Uh, so the tree planting campaign restores tree canopy. So we'll plant red buds, which are smaller trees, but we'll also plant other species of tree that are, are restoring the urban tree canopy uh, in the neighborhood. But all of that together can help to sort of remit uh, the identity of the city. So, you know, zoom back out, I'm an urban designer, so what we do as a profession is we zoom in and zoom out. So, is this bench comfortable? Okay, that's important. Is this building the right size? That's important. Does the city work, right? So that's what, how we constantly think. So, you know, zooming out, the idea that this part of the city needs something special, it needs something different, uh, and that's what this project can do. Uh, and it's just one other layer uh, of this sort of campaign for what it is that helps make people love their city and that there's a level of participation in that. Uh, so we just launched the website, indyredbud.org, uh, and so you can go, if you live in that neighborhood, you can go and request a tree. Uh, if not, you can sort of get uh, inf more information about the project or, or volunteer uh, for when we do our sort of tree planting campaigns later. Um, but the work sort of already started, again, Short Ridge, which is kind of an anchor in the community, the high school. We already did some plantings with, with some kids from the school and neighbors, and really uh, bringing together this notion that everybody can contribute uh, to their city, and that everyone uh, has sort of a say in how that happens, from uh, the neighbor to uh, this little girl who is going to grow up uh, in Indy. Uh, so to end the talk, uh, I always like to uh, ask the question, what was this about? Uh, what is it about? Uh, and this is coming from, uh, really, I consider it a manifesto, really. So the people that in the, the 1940s at Flanner House uh, were asking what were they doing and what was their role, and they did it by asking uh, the question, what is this about? They said it's about people, it's about their needs, about their abilities, the land they live on, the land they till, about the food they grow, the cities they live in, about the jobs they do, how they do them. It's about the houses in which they live, uh, about what people know and what they don't know. And that's the important one, is what people don't know is all, very often important, and what they ought to know uh, to make the America is still greater. So I have one little video to show you. That's it. Thank you. So, yes, uh, so that's what we're starting now with this campaign. It's essentially, we'll work first with a lot of the homeowners, of course, in the neighborhood because they own the property. The, the sort of absentee landlord is, is going to be a problem, but we are going to be doing outreach to uh, the other property owners in the neighborhood. 
Uh, something I want to mention about that is that something that we're embedding into the red butt planting is sort of an information campaign. Uh, so this is a little wonky planner stuff, but there's a premise called uh, crime prevention through environmental through environmental design, so how people can plant their yards and do things that help with uh, reducing crime actually through studies. So part of that campaign will be explaining to people, okay, plant the red bud, but here are also some other things you can do that can help uh, with overall safety uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, the, the crime prevention through environmental design. So there's sort of a whole spectrum of, of different measures, so it can be everything from you know, lighting to the height of your fence to visibility of where you plant things. So if you've got, you know, overgrown bushes and things like that that uh, obscure visibility for people being able to keep eyes on the street. So a lot of this sort of eyes on the street design that can help uh, uh, with crime. But there's even kind of more aggressive measures like planting, you know, thorny bushes by your windows and other kind of stuff. So. There, there's sort of a whole toolkit and we'll be uh, putting that onto our website so that people can have access to that information. Um, so part of what we're doing with Urban Patch is that it's actually uh, set up as a social enterprise model. So uh, the properties that we're getting uh, and developing, we're, we started with those uh, two, but we now are up to six actually. Um, but every time we get a, a house, we do the improvements and we keep the rents uh, at sort of what's affordable for that rate. So that's what we're doing directly. Uh, in that neighborhood, there's the Mapleton Fall Creek Development Corporation. So they're really the main player in that neighborhood for new housing development. Uh, and a lot of their programs are using uh, either federal or other funds that uh, restrict uh, the incomes. So, you know, there's going to be a balance, there's going to be some market rate uh, appreciation in, in some of the properties, but I think a lot of the work that we're doing is to find sort of a balance uh, where enough of the property and enough of the neighborhood uh, stays at an affordable rate. Uh, and because there's frankly so much vacant <laughs> land and vacant buildings, uh, it's sort of a realistic measure to, to work in that way. It's very different, you know, when I'm in New York, that narrative is exactly it. You, somebody washes their window and the property is worth $10,000 more. It's, it's crazy. Um, but you know, here in Indianapolis, the market is, is a little different. And I think a lot of the discussion is the, the rate of change uh, and the pace at, at which uh, property values uh, are adjusted is, is really the big issue. So this neighborhood, it's, it's going to be a little, I think, more incremental in the approach. but. We, are, in our very small way, are, are working on that because the properties that we have, we keep uh, at the affordable rent. Yes, um, yeah, I didn't show much of my New York work, but the, the kind of the funny thing is, you know, when I'm in New York, my hat is to work on, you know, major, huge projects, you know, two, three billion dollar projects, large scale redevelopment, uh, and so what, I see happening here in Indianapolis is a very different sort of situation. Uh, you know, Indianapolis is my home. This is where I grew up. I went to school 60 and I went to Short Ridge and believe it or not, people always are shocked. You know, I went to Arlington High School, you know, so Ivy League graduate. I actually teach in Ivy League University and I went to IPS Arlington High School. Just keep that in mind. Um, you know, this is my home. Uh, I love Indianapolis, like all of you, I assume, do. And the thing about Indy is that it is very special and unique in that it's kind of in this sweet spot between being a big enough city that you can be a city, right? Uh, but it's also small enough that the opportunities uh, are really here. Uh, the work that I'm able to do here in Indianapolis, I couldn't do in New York, it would cost, you know, $20 million to, uh, to do some of this stuff there. So, you know, there's really opportunity here and I've, uh, you know, from a distance, you know, I've, I guess I last lived here in 1997, so it's been a while, uh, but coming back, I'm seeing the city grow and develop and really, you know, come into its, its sort of own and identity and it's, it's beautiful uh, what's happening here. And, you know, living in New York, of course, people were making fun of me with your, uh, you know, your governor. Um, <laughs> I, 
a lot of questions about your governor. Uh, but, you know, the response that, that I saw happen uh, out of Indianapolis and that everybody in the country saw, I think, is what keeps me coming back is seeing that, you know, things are really uh, progressing here in a way that is, is inspiring. Uh, so it's, you know, people like in this room that are a part of that, um, but it's, it's really the whole city. It's, it's everyone that is trying to figure out how to make Indianapolis uh, better. Again, we're doing that in our very small way, uh, but you know, adding all of that up is, is what is making this city a great city.